Thank you for the invitation to come and minister God's word tonight. And it's just lovely to see friends old and new. <laughs> but uh, it's always a privilege. And I want to thank you also for the prayers that you've been praying for the forthcoming trip, which will be a fortnight Friday that I fly out to the Philippines. And so I value much prayers in that. And God's a good God. Amen. And he confirms everything. When we're in the will of God, he confirms everything. Just want to share a little bit of testimony just to encourage your faith. And I've kind of known this over 30 years in walking with the Lord in full-time ministry. But not so long ago, a couple of weeks ago, we booked the flights on the Friday. And I was at a meeting the next day in Liverpool and a complete stranger, a man in his 80s, walked up to me. Never met him before in my life. And he just came up to me and he said, young lady, I like that bit. He said, young lady, he said, the Lord's told me you'll have need of this. And he put this, I thought it was a book in my hands, in brown manila thing, and I thought, what's this? So I just put it in my Bible case. I got home 10 past 11 that night, and there was a thousand pound in crisp 20 pound notes, so the tickets were paid for the next day. Isn't God good? Amen. Booked in faith, paid for the next day. God never fails. God never fails. Great is his faith, but I love this up here. Great is thy faithfulness. And for those of you who don't know the Lord, I want to just say, Wet your appetites a little bit because you don't know what you're missing because he's a wonderful saviour, he's a faithful friend, he is my vision, he is the centre of my life, he is my path and guide. And when we've got our security in him, I tell you we don't need to worry about the banks going bust or what's going to happen with the elections or anything else because my lovely God is sovereign and in control of every single situation. And what a rest and what a peace that brings to our hearts. What a wonderful truth it is to know him. If you have your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter 6. Going to read a very familiar passage. It's what the Lord's laid on my heart for you here tonight. And I'm going to read the familiar story, but not so familiar because there's always more. The word of God's never familiar, wrong word, but um, it is popular to us. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites because the power of Midian was so oppressive the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, in the caves, and in the strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples invaded the country. And they camped on the land, and they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt, from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God, and do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in opera that belonged to Joash the Abirazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. What a wonderful story that is, and we're going to pick it up in a little while. But let's just pray, shall we? Let's just ask God's blessing on his word. Father God, we love you, Lord, tonight. We're gathered here, Lord, because we love you and because we need you. We need to know you. And we need to hear from you. We need to worship you as you truly deserve. We need an anointing. I need an anointing, Lord, to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. And these people need you, Lord. Not me, but they need you. Help me, Lord. Challenge us to see ourselves tonight as you see us. And do a deep work in all of our hearts. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe God wants to talk to you tonight. And when I say you, I don't mean the one on the left of you or the one on the right of you. 
or your husband, your wife, or your I mean you. The Lord laid this upon my heart. He wants to speak a personal word to your heart tonight. It's for you. And I hope you came with an expectation for God to do just that. Believing God has something to say to you personally. Remember an old preacher saying sometimes, he said, put your hands up if you came expecting something and not many hands cut up. And he said, well, you may as well go home because if you came expecting nothing, you'll go home with nothing. And he challenged me. I've never forgotten this as a young Christian. And I thought, no, no, that challenged me. That really challenged me because many times we come into God's house and under God's word and in his direct presence, but we come not with an expectation in our hearts to hear from God or to meet with God. We come maybe just to, be, to, to entertain, something entertains us again, or we've come to listen to just another message. But God has laid this word on my heart tonight. And this is what I would entitle it, or he's led me to entitle it. Don't underestimate the anointing of God on your life. He's speaking to you personally. Don't underestimate the anointing of God on your life. God came to Gideon. He called him a mighty man of valor. And it was a time when they were impoverished, we read, by the Midianites. And we're going to see the power of the anointing of God on Gideon's life. But we're going to look at the man realistically. But we're going to see something very special. And I want you, and I want myself again to be encouraged to apply that personally to ourselves. Let's look first of all at why they were in the situation they were in. It says, Gideon said to God, if God is with us, why are we in the mess that we're in? How many times have you heard that said to you? If there's really a God, even in church circles, if God was really with me, why is it that it's more bad news? And instead of getting better, it's getting worse. I wonder whether you feel like that tonight. Or if God's really for us, why is it everything seems to be against us, falling apart? You know, in Judges 6, the Bible gives us an answer. It says in verse 8, the Lord sent a, sent a prophet and he reminded them he brought them out of Egypt. In verse 10, God said, I'm your God. Let's apply it to us as a church tonight, as believers tonight. Don't be afraid of the gods, small g, little gods of the Amorites, but you have not obeyed my voice. The Lord took me to that this week again in preparation for today and again this afternoon as I got alone with him. But you have not obeyed my voice. You know, I'm not here to tell you that every obstacle of the cares is self-inhibited or the result necessarily of disobedience. The Bible doesn't teach that. However, it does teach that our disobedience has consequences. And the reason they were in the mess they were in, quote, God speaking, you've not obeyed my voice. It's as simple as that. God said it. And we must understand it as God's people. If we do not obey the voice of God, there will be catastrophic consequences in our lives. We need to hear that as Christians today. We need to hear the balance of God's word today. You know, I've watched people, and I've done it myself, and I've had to hit my knees and repent and ask God with due repentance to forgive me. But, you know, I've watched people book that rule and try to find some way around it year in and year out. And life remains in the same mess year in and year out because they've not accepted a biblical fact. The divine law that says that you can't disobey God some and get, somehow get away without suffering consequences. We pay every time, don't we? Even as believers. Praise God for repentance. Praise God there's a way back for believers. Praise God if we confess our sin is faithful and just to forgive us. But if we're not careful, we can just slip into a very kind of indifferent attitude towards this holy God that we serve and think any old thing will do. It was not God's fault they were in the situation they were in in this story. They refused to obey him. And in our culture today, people get into unbelievable amounts of debt and then ask God where he is. Isn't that the truth? I've drawn alongside many in counsel with them. And they're saying, well, I mean, I'm in a real tough financial situation. Would you pray for me? I have a problem, Lord. I'm suffering. Now, had they obeyed God in a biblical principle and obeyed God in, in, an, in an understanding of how to manage their money and put it right and give God the first, hallelujah, then maybe they wouldn't be in the mess that they were in. And some people, and I've also seen people get into unbiblical relationships, unequally yoked, 
knowing what the truth is, but choosing to ignore it, and they suffer the consequences. I know also people, in fact, I've talked with some even recently that have struck up a relationship with someone and they've been strong in the Lord and a Christian, a devout Christian, but they, they meet someone and my first question, is he saved? Well, no, Gina. I know what it says, but he's interested in, and I believe that he's going to come to the Lord. And it often ends in pain, doesn't it, in divorce. It's not in the Bible. Full stop, do not, God said, do not, do not, full stop. And yet we think we know better than God. You cannot break the commands of God and not suffer the consequences. And when all goes wrong, and we've been there, we shake our fists at God and we cry out to God like these people in the story. And the answer comes back. You didn't obey my voice. It's not my fault. It's because we serve God half-heartedly. And then we ask, where is God many times when we serve him half-heartedly? You want to serve God when it's convenient many times. This challenge has been coming across the pulpit for quite a while now in new life. God's serious. He's, I believe we're in the last of the last days. Do you believe that? And I believe God's shaking the church like never before. And God is separating the worshippers from the non-worshippers. He is drawing a line. And he is bringing us back to the truth of his word. You know, I've got to think and imagine you're about to get married, you're a young woman, and finally you meet this wonderful, handsome man after a long time, and he, he finally pops the question, will you marry me? And, and then it kind of, she turns around and, and has a little think. And imagine her saying, and it's just a little story to illustrate a point, imagine her saying, okay, but here's the deal. I'm going to be faithful 85% of the time, that's the deal. But 15% of the time... I'm going to do my own thing because I have my own interests and I want a bit of space. And so 85%, I'm all yours, but 15% of the time I'm not going to be faithful. I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> Imagine a man putting a ring on that. I don't think so. I don't think so. And yet most people enter into a relationship with God in exactly the same attitude. Amen? No intention. Lord, come into my life, save me. You died for me. I give you my life. But here's the deal, Lord. I'll fit you in when I can. 85% of the time. Why are we in the mess we're in, church? It's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. And yet God is saying, I knew it all the time. Knew it all the time. Praise God for his grace. I believe God's saying 85% of the time won't cut it, but here's what I want us to see. Here's what I want us to see in this story. God still answers. Coming back to the story. What a gracious, loving God we have. That he still answers when we make a mess of things and it's our own fault and we're suffering the consequences of our own disobedience. Praise God for his grace and his mercy. Let's not presume upon it. So why were they in the mess they were in? You know, and leading up to chapter 6, four times already the Bible says, and God delivered them, and then they did evil again in the sight of the Lord. In other words, God bailed them out again, and then they got in a sticky mess again. And they cried out to the Lord again, and then we read again, and the Lord delivered them. And he gave them another judge, and another judge. And we've read from chapter 6, but up to chapter 6, he's already done it four times. The church is no different. And they cry out and they cry out again. And God still answered them. God still answers them. When we call upon him, he's there for us. His answer is Gideon. God comes to him and says, you mighty man of valor. God says in, Gideon says in verse 15, I'm making excuses, my clan is the weakest and we know the story so well. I am the least in my father's house and my father's house is the least in all the tribes and he goes on like this and I pray tonight and I prayed this afternoon that somehow we will we'll just see something and God will stick something in our souls tonight that will change our lives forever the way God sees you and me tonight is not the way everybody else does aren't you glad it's not even the way we see ourselves God came to who on the outside this Gideon and it's not like the statements he made were not true. Gideon was not lying when he said that, you know, I'm, I'm the weakest in his father's house and his father's clan is the least of the least. He wasn't lying in any of that. 
And God did not dispute that. But he looked straight through it. And this is how he sees you and me tonight. And it ought to thrill your soul. He looks straight through it all and he says, you mighty man of valor. That's what he's saying to you. It's a personal word to you. He's saying, you Gary, you mighty man. You Pauline, you, you mighty woman of valor. Amen. He's looking at me and let's take this as God's speaking to me tonight. It's his word to me. It's his word to you. And it's hard to believe that you are who God says you are. That I am who God says I am. It's hard to believe that the anointing on your life, on my life, on my life is enough is enough to fulfill whatever God has called me to do for him. We've got to believe that, haven't we, church? If God has called you and I in these last days to be a member of his body, individually gifted, individually anointed, then the anointing on your life and mine is sufficient for whatever he's called me to do. And if we don't get that stuck in our soul and in our spirit man, we're forever going to be making excuses and going up and down. But we need to have a healthy awareness of who we are in Christ as God sees us tonight. And I trust we'll see that. Not just individually, but corporately. He's empowered his individual children. And God will never ever call you or me to stand strong in any situation and then leave you powerless to do it. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> God will never ever call you to stand in any situation and leave you powerless in it. If he's called you, he'll equip you. If he's called you, he'll make a way for you. If he's called you, he'll have somebody put a thousand pounds in your hand to pay for the ticket that you'd spend three hours the afternoon before praying in because I didn't have it. If God's called you, he's gone ahead of you. Amen? And we walk into that provision, be it spiritual, be it strength, be it anointing, be it provision, materially, whatever it is, God's saying it to you tonight. Because we tend to look at someone else and think God's blessing them, God's meeting them. They can be used of God, but not me. That was Gideon's attitude. He anointed Gideon. He's anointed you. Saved child of God. And God sees something that the rest of the world is oblivious to. And a large percentage of the Christians in the church are oblivious to. I believe it's wake up time. And here's what I want you to know today. And you know the story of Gideon. We know the story of Gideon. You know where this is going. We know that God is going to end up winning a tremendous victory using Gideon. A tremendous battle. He's totally outnumbered. And God called this man who it seemed to the world and it seemed to even himself is the worst person for the job, the least likely for the job. And when Gideon heard, mighty man of valor, I kind of paraphrase it, you know. He's probably thinking and saying, well, yeah, mighty man of valor, you mustn't, you, you don't realize God, you know, I'm five foot seven or whatever it was he was. You know, I'm so many pounds or whatever it was he was and the smallest of all my brothers. And, and if you're calling me a mighty man of valor, well, not. <laughs> no way. And if we're really honest, and I've done this, I've done this. Yeah, Lord, it's for them, it's not for me. But God's spoken it to me. It's his word to me. It's his word to you tonight. And here's what we must see about the anointing of God upon your life. The anointing of God. When we're born again of the spirit of God, God puts his Holy Spirit in us. Doesn't he? And the anointing of God is within us. It tells in the epistles of John. The, the anointing we have abided and remaineth. In the Old Testament it came upon people. It left. The Holy Ghost came and went. But we have an abiding anointing within us. And the potential to be all that God's called us to be. And the anointing of God upon our lives. It's not just a thought. It's not just an idea. It's not just a word that preachers use. It's a real tangible thing in your life. Whereby the Spirit of God specifically empowers you to do what God's called you to do. To meet every need spiritually, physically, in every area. And it's real. The anointing of God is real. And the anointing of God, what's it for? It's always, ultimately, for others. It's not bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. God wants to bless us. Amen? It's always others. God fill me to benefit others. God use me to bless your body. God use me to build others up. It's always others. Jesus came into this world and it was always others. Always others. God anointed the judges to deliver other people. 
In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said it when he opened the scrolls. This is what he said about being anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free, to open blinded eyes and deliver the oppressed, and to bring freedom from bondage. Recovery of sight to the blind. The anointing of God is upon me. God wants us to get a revelation of that. The anointing of God is upon you to do exactly the same. We're light, we're salt in this world. You know, when there comes a time in your spiritual life when it's wonderful to be ministered to, to be ministered to, to be ministered to, and when we need it, we must avail of it. It's what body ministry is all about. But isn't it wonderful when we come to a place of maturity? where we can go to God directly and we can just be in that place of strength with him and praise God for his grace to keep us there and we need not presume on that. That's why we need to stay close to him every moment of every day. Stay close to him. But isn't it wonderful when we can turn up to church, not for me, but for others? If we all showed up just to be used for others, that's real body ministry, isn't it? Let me pray for you, sister. Let me pray for you, brother. And being sensitive in the uh, individual gifting, so that mercy gift or whatever it is, just to pick up on it and to draw alongside and to be there for someone. So the anointing of God upon your life. God is saying he wants you to know by the Spirit that you're a change agent in the world today. That's why you're in the church, even in your family, in your workplace, in the office. God's put you there because he wants you there for you to be like to you to be sought, for you to minister, for you to set captives free and to accomplish what he's called you to do. One of the greatest problems we have, church, is we know God has called us to do something. We know that. We hear it every week. And we may be stirred to action. And when we hear a word preached or the Spirit's moving or we spend time alone with God and his word, suddenly God speaks, a verse pops out, hits you in the heart, and you think, wow, Lord, you're speaking to me. And we know that God stirred us. I believe we've been stirred and stirred that many times. We're dizzy, church. We just want to be stirred again. And God's saying, no, no. What did you do with what I told you? What did you do with what I stirred you to do? Because it's the problem. You know what we do? We start talking like Gideon. This is what happens when God stirs our hearts. When God challenges us with a word. And we know it's, he's speaking to us personally. We start talking like Gideon. Well, maybe I was emotionally moved in the meeting. <laughs> Have you heard that one? Oh, Mel, when I read the word, God wasn't really telling me that. I, I must have imagined it. And just look at me and all the unqualified reasons. Surely God isn't calling me to do this and God isn't calling me to and nudging me to, to go and knock on that neighbor's door and give them that tract or, or, or go and speak that word or phone someone and say, I'm praying for you. God isn't really speaking to me. And we start talking like Gideon started talking. And yet God had just said, you mighty man of valor. And like Gideon, we end up concluding, who me? But we must see this and we must hear this. And I pray God will somehow allow us to see it tonight. If you hear nothing else, hear these next few sentences. God does not use you or me because of my talents or yours. And God does not use you because of your own fleshly strength or energy or character or even your intellect or wisdom. God doesn't use you for that. God does not use you because of all your efforts and all your hard work and all your labor. God uses us when we realize that all we have is not enough. And it will never be enough. God uses us because of the anointing of God in our lives. And that's the only thing he'll use. Amen. He'll not glory in any flesh. He's told me that. Jean, I'm not going to use your intellect. Get that out the window. I'm not going to give you your strength. You ain't got any. I'm praying over there for this next trip coming in a fortnight. It's going to be a marathon trip. I'm trusting God. I'm going to walk into his provision by faith. And he's going to be there to meet me at every point of me. He's never failed me yet. But I don't have it. I haven't got a clue. I've never been there. I've never been in situations I'm going to encounter. I haven't got a clue. And you haven't got a clue in that workplace and in that home situation. And you haven't got a clue. But God knows. And God's saying through this mouth tonight, and don't see G, listen to what God's saying. I've anointed you, and I'm going to use the anointing that you have, because that's more than enough. There's an anointing on your life and my life, and we need to be able to say with confidence, I know I'm anointed. 
You need to be able to say, I know I'm, an, I'm the authority of God's word. I have an anointing because I'm born again of the spirit of God and the spirit of God lives in me. We need to grow in things, yes. We need to develop more, more, more faith in those areas and we grow from, from strength to strength in it. But nevertheless, it's got nothing to do with me. It's all about the anointing. And I believe he wants me to say this tonight, to men in here. And this is a woman speaking and I'm being careful when I say this. But God's saying to men, we need to come up, we need to be able to identify as men with the word of God. I believe you, God, to be a loving husband. And I believe you, God, that you've anointed me to be the leader in my home. I believe you, God, to be all you've called me to be as a man in the home. God's anointed men in here today. To be the leader, that, to take up the responsibility that you've called me to take up for the spiritual welfare of my wife and my children. God's anointed me to do it. We can't say, Lord, I can't. I can't make excuses. God says, I've anointed you. And if that's his word to you and what he requires of you, then he has anointed you to fulfill his word. Amen. To the women, I believe God. To be that wife, to support, to respect, to be alongside, to work together with that husband. That's the calling of God. God's anointed women in this place tonight. And I believe men, women and children have to start agreeing with God and believing that they can do it because God said we can do it. We need to stop making excuses. Excuses like Gideon made. Let's not insult the spirit of grace when God's word's already spoken through his word. That he's anointed us to be all he's called us to be. He's anointed us to give our lives 100%. God's equipped us. God's equipped us. And God wants us to take our hands off our lives and off our plans and seek him for his plans. And we're going to discover that he leads us in his plans. And we won't be playing, as I call it, spiritual gymnastics and wondering what in the world God wants me to do. Because we'll know what God wants us to do. Because he doesn't have us confused. We'll step out in that anointing and do what he's called us to do. That he's equipped us for. He's anointed us. Don't underestimate the anointing of God upon your life. And quit thinking there's too many reasons that I'm not qualified. The truth is, you and I never were qualified. It's the anointing that heals and delivers. It's the anointing that sets captives free. It's the anointing that's going to, when you speak to someone, open the understanding, their spiritual eyes to see and understand what you're saying. It's the anointing. We have to rely upon the anointing and not our persuasion and not our efforts. It's all the anointing. I praise God for the anointing because we don't have it. And he never fails. He never fails. It says in verse 33, the Midianites, Midianites get a hold of the fact that Gideon is going to, to come and there's going to be a confrontation. It says in verse 33, that all the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the other, remember all David Nellis saying, all the other parasites, I remember him saying that. And the peoples of the east gathered together and crossed and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Now the enemy all came together. Now Gideon is suddenly realizing who God's called him to be. And he's beginning to grasp hold of, hey, this might be real. And he begins to get ready for what? And the enemy hears of it. They're ready for war. And their attitude was, and I'm going to take a bit of liberty here. I can imagine them saying, if those pipsqueaks think that they're going to do something great and come out against us, then they think they've got another thing coming because we're going to totally annihilate them. The word got out and they all came together. All these ites came together, all the peoples of the East. And I like to think that when they're all talking, they're all kind of, they're all, they're all kind of, um, mocking you know what Gideon and mocking his his little band there as it were and I want to say something here that I believe with all of my heart hell will always challenge you on what God wants you to be in God when we step out and go on the offensive hell will come against you but praise God we have the victory in Jesus Christ there will be a people that will come against you there will be those in the office and in the home that will oppose you when we step out with that anointing, when we step out knowing God has equipped me to be a somebody in God, then there will always be opposition. And if we're not careful, when these insults come, we'll start believing them and we'll question ourselves. And we'll begin to stand back. We'll question it. Did God actually say? 
And when you question it, then you will be overcome instead of being coming the overcomer. But our God is able. Praise God, our God is able. And we've got to believe that. Somebody once said, stop doubting your doubts and just do it. I like that. Stop doubting your doubts and just do it. You know, we've heard it in every meeting. I'm sure you've heard it here too. We've been challenged. The Holy Spirit keeps on challenging from the pulpit and yet many, many times, knowing his word, knowing the truth of it, many, many believers, talking to believers now, remain neutral and retreat. And I believe we're living in very, very dark days. We know that. It's getting darker still. That which is filthy is getting filthier still. That which is lawless, lawlessness abound. It's the last of the last days. And if the church doesn't get a hold of what they have and who they are in God, then for sure that darkness is going to overwhelm us. But praise God, he's got the bigger picture and he's coming back. He's coming back for an army. And that corporate anointing, I believe, individually first and then corporate is going to break through. So Gideon says we've got to build an army and God's got an army, amen. He's building up a people, ready? In chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Then Jeroboam, that's Gideon's new name that they gave him, and Baal is the false god the Midianites worship. Jerob means to be at war with. So the new name that's at war with Baal. I like that. At war with Baal. What a great name. In verse 3, now it says, Proclaim in the ears of the people. And he says, Whoever is fearful and trembling... Let him turn back and leave. 22,000 returned. They had 32,000. And 22,000. 32,000 showed up to be part of the battle. And 22,000 became fearful and didn't want to fight. They were glad to leave at the first opportunity. But the Lord kind of showed me something this week, meditating on this. Got to see it realistically. If we were in their shoes, they were facing a real battle. This was not Nintendo, this was a real battle. And many of those men knew that they probably would lose their lives. Not a resting match. Some of them were not going to live. Some of them would be, would be killed. Some of them wouldn't go home and see their families and their wives and their kids again. So let's not tease the 22,000 who were afraid. They were just being honest. But let us also see in that that fear can stop you dead in your tracks too. Stop you from doing what God's called you to do. Fear, fear will stop you from being humble. It's true. Being afraid of what it will look like to humble yourself. When God nudges your heart and says, I'm dealing with your heart, I want repentance. Fear will stop us being humble. Fear will stop that man becoming the head of that home. Stop that woman doing what she's supposed to do as the wife alongside that husband. Fear, people being afraid of what it would look like if they did things God's way in regard to their finances. If I were really faithful, Lord, if I really obeyed those nudgings and those promptings when you're asking me to give something and you know I can't afford to give it, but you're testing my faith anyway. I don't know whether that's how that happened to you. It's when you've got now that God says, I want you to give the very last that you've got. But Lord, we can't afford it. God says, I'm not asking you if you can afford it. I'm asking you to do it. And when we step out, not in fear, but in faith, we suddenly discover that somebody's putting a thousand pound in your hand because it opens the door for blessing. God's testing our faith to see if it's real, to see if it's just in our heads or whether it's real faith. Do we really believe this God? But fear will stop us dead in our tracks. Fear will stop us getting our time as a discipline. People say, oh, don't get into 10% and all the milk is at X stuff. But my answer to that is, he's not asking you for 10, asking for 10%. He's asking you if you go over to ask for 100%. He wants it all. He's Lord, amen. And be honest, many times in our Christian lives, we've known what God's word says. We've known week by week the challenge he's bringing to our hearts. And yet we stand still in our tracks because of fear because we analyze it so we won't do what God's called us to do and he's anointed us to do so we miss the blessing but I'm going to repeat it again don't underestimate the anointing of God on your life it's real and here's what I want us to see about the dwindling down of these people they would eventually dwindle down from 32,000 going against an enemy that was as the locust and as the sand of the sea it says innumerable Third, dwindle down to 300 people. 
from 32,000. And even that was small in comparison to the enemy. The Lord spoke to me this afternoon. He said, I want you to say this tonight, Jean. Sometimes you have to get people out of your life to accomplish the will of God for your life. I'm going to repeat that because I know it's for someone in here tonight. Sometimes you have to get people out of your life in order to accomplish the will of God for your life. God will reduce. God will move out. And the hindrances will go in order to release us in that anointing. But let me clarify what I mean by that. And notice here, these were not Gideon's enemies that left him. These were on his team. These were part of the team. And they wanted Gideon to win. For their own sakes, for their family's sakes, for their kids' sakes, for their own well-being's sake. They wanted Gideon to win. Even though they left him, they were really for him. But sometimes God does not want everybody in the world helping us fight our battle or being involved. Sometimes God says no. You've got to be dwindled down in that area, whatever it is. And I believe God's saying it like this to Gideon and to us individually tonight, personally. <coughs> Gideon, you're going to have to trust me now. It's not that these people were against you, Gideon. No, I've let them go. I've been the one that's responsible for them leaving. I put it in their hearts to go. Because Gideon, I'm fulfilling my purpose and planning your life. You are now going to have to trust me. I don't know whether God's ever done that in your life, but he's done that in my life over and over and over again in this last 30 years particularly. You're going to have to trust me now, G. There's no way out here. You're going to have to trust me. And when God dwindles it all down to you and God, you're in a good place. Because your God is a big God. He's a big God. Amen? And then you prove God. Then you prove who he is. And more than that, you get more intimate with him and you get to know who he really is. That he is that faithful God and that he is that Jehovah Jireh and he is that Jehovah Rapha and Rophi and he is that Shema and he is all those wonderful things that we have the names for in Jehovah. He's all of those and so much more. And your relationship with him goes deeper and stronger and you prove God for yourself. That's what God's doing with Gideon. That's what God wants to do with you tonight. You're going to have to trust me. There's going to be less of you, Gideon, and more of me. And you're going to walk toward it, Gideon. You're going to feel outnumbered. I love this bit. You're going to feel outnumbered. And you're going to be thrust out there. And maybe you're going to be feeling let down. And how many times have we felt let down? That's okay. But you still feel the feelings. That's okay. God said you're going to feel it. But don't underestimate the anointing of God in your life. It's not the number of people. It's not how many talents you have. It's not how much money that's in the bank. It's not how big your building is and how many members you've got, church. No, it's none of that. It's God and you. Amen? It's God and you. It's the God we serve. The God that has unlimited power, unlimited resources. Hallelujah. And is there anything too hard for the Lord? Absolutely nothing. So even though only 300, we find in chapter 7 and chapter 8, it says, And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who put water to their mouths, there was a little test there, they had to go down to the stream, and the 300 put it up to their mouths, he said. And these are the ones, he said, that you're going to use. And they took provision, and he sent the rest home, and they moved forward. And Gideon is confident, and he's made up his mind now, yet, yeah, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. But nevertheless, and I want to add something here, because it's all been kind of positive here to now. Nevertheless, he was scared stiff. And we see that in the story. He was absolutely scared stiff. Sometimes serving God is scary. Even for the best of God's heroes. And I've read many autobiographies, biographies, of great men and women of God who've been on the front line, and yet they were scared stiff. And yet they kept on moving, they kept on trusting, and they kept on believing because they knew that they had an anointing and they knew that they were in a place where it had to be God and God proved them true. So God sends Gideon, knowing he scourged stiff, he sends them down ready to the enemy camp. He says, I want you to go down the hill. And Gideon sneaks out, scared stiff, in chapter in verses 10 and 11, 
And God told him, and he heard a man telling of a dream. He says, hey, mate, he said, a cake of barley tumbled, barley bread tumbled into the camp and struck down the tent. He said, the tent turned upside down. And verse 14, his mate says, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon. And here's scary Gideon. I think it's very funny. He's scary Gideon suddenly getting an understanding that the enemy's scared of him. And into his hand, the man goes on to say. <laughs> they've got the majority. Into his hand, the man says. Into this Gideon. And he's listening. God has delivered the Midianites and all the host. And Gideon is hearing a report before the event. Isn't God a wonderful God to do that in Gideon's life? Allow him to go down the hill to listen to the outcome of what's going to happen before it's even happened yet. Just to encourage his man. And when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, we read, he worshipped the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. God meets you in the way. And he, he returned. He went down skirt. God sent him down to be encouraged in his faith. God will always encourage our faith when we need it most. And when he returned, this is the change, Gideon. He says, arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hands, he says to the 300. With such confidence, such assurance, with a victorious spirit, he comes back and he encourages others because of God's faithfulness. I pray that God will let you hear what he's saying tonight. Don't underestimate the anointing of God on your life. God gave you and he has given you the same anointing that he gave Gideon that day. I wonder, and I got to thinking of this, I wonder if God gave us the same opportunity in the spiritual realm to just hear what the enemy is saying about you and me. I wonder what we would hear. I wonder what we would hear. I sure do pray that they'd be saying something similar about me that they said about Gideon. That Jean Foster, God's got his hand on her life. She's been knocked back a time or two, but she keeps getting up again. She's been homeless four times, but she keeps trusting. She's been on death's door with E. coli and typhoid in third world hospital. She keeps trusting. I'd like to think that that's how the enemy's talking about me. That despite what comes against me, I keep getting up. Why? Because I'm trusting in a God who cannot fail. I wonder what the enemy's saying about you. I wonder. I wonder whether he's saying something like that. Or I wonder whether or not the enemy would say something like this. Every time we send a little bit of a, an upset into her life or his life, uh, it's easy. Easy to get them discouraged. I know just how to stop them going to those meetings there in, in that little fellowship there in Kent Street. At. Let's just allow this. Let's just work this. And when they get a little bit down, the first thing to go is they'll quit going to meetings. They'll quit reading the Bible. They'll, they'll, they'll quit, you know, praying. They'll, oh, it's easy to get them off track. The easiest thing in the world. Because every single time, they'll get disillusioned and they'll doubt. It's easy to keep them down. I wonder whether that's what the enemy is saying about you tonight. It's a challenge. But the enemy said of Gideon, he is able to do this thing with 300. Because God's on his side. God's on his side. And the only time we find out about what the enemy is saying is in the privacy of its own camp. In the story. You know, if those enemies had run into Gideon head on, face to face, they probably would have laid him waste. That's how the devil works in our lives. He doesn't want us to know that he skirts stiff of us. Because he fears the anointing that's upon your life and upon my life and in the church of Jesus Christ. And he has us looking everywhere else and at everything else. It's getting worse. I have no ability to do this. It's hard to do it. It's hard to step out. And when I'm asked to give my testimony, I couldn't stand at the front and tell people I'm a Christian. I keep being asked to give my testimony, but oh, I can't do it. Ask someone else, me. And ask me to stand up in the public place. Ask me to, to speak out loud in the office and show my colours in the office. I mean, they'll ask me to scorn. I can't do that. 
But God keeps speaking, do it, do it, do it. Whatever it is, you'll know what it is. God's saying, do it, do it. Give that thing. Pass that on, and I'll bless you for it. Why don't we step out in the anointing that we have? Because God's anointing on your life. And forget what the enemy is saying. Let's not cave in many times. Gideon wins. Gideon wins. Because God's path can't be stopped. And Gideon wins because God's plan can't be thwarted. Gideon wins because God spoke a word to him personally. God called him. God anointed him. God said, you're a mighty man of valor. He was alive. And God anointed him to win, not lose. And that same word is for us, church, tonight. You know, it's a comforting thought to me. To me personally. To one who doesn't always get it right, and we can all identify. Who doesn't always feel the way it should feel. He doesn't always think the way I should think. Do the things I know I should do and love and forgive the way I know I should love and forgive. Pray and study. You name it, we can all have a big long list there. But I've learned one thing in 53 years of being a Christian from a young child. If I stay on the path that God marks out for my life, and every time he keeps reminding me of the same thing, I can ignore it and ignore it and ignore it, but the moment I get around to actually doing it, I move on and I grow. And I come into a fuller awareness of that anointing. And into a more mature relationship with him. If I stay on that path, and that's the path he's anointed me and you to walk in, then all of hell can come against us. But it won't stop us. Because God's plan can't be thwarted in my life. God says, I've started a work in you, Jim. Hallelujah. I'd like to think that when I finish, I get the finishing line of, I'd hear what Paul said he'd like to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I called you way back in the early 60s. I anointed you, put my spirit in you. It's been an uphill and downhill day, but nevertheless, it's because of my anointing, you're still standing. I know that is the truth in my life. Let's not give up on that. Let's walk in the victory that we have. Gideon called of God, stepped up and reminded of God. Reminded by God of who he was. The least of his family. The weakest in the clan. The least of the tribes. That's who he was. But God said, I've called you and I've anointed you. Let's not underestimate the anointing of God in our lives. I want to close. We quote a verse, you know, if God is for us. If God is for us. We meditated on this this afternoon for a while. Meeting tonight. If God is for us. I felt the Lord say to me. If God is for you. No, Jane, I want you to tell the people tonight. God is for you. It's no if. God is for me. God is for us, church. God is on our side. God has called us. God has saved us if we've given our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we've not, we need to. Because if we've not, we're going to a lost eternity. We won't end up in heaven. We won't know this God and me with this God one day. And our life is but a vapor. We need to get right with God. That's why he died for you. But if we're saved tonight, we have an anointing. Men have an anointing to lead in their homes. Women have an anointing to be all the called to be in God. Their giftings and anointings. We have an anointing. Leaders have an anointing to lead. And we have that anointing. It's powerful. Let's walk each day and let's discover it. And let's stand. And let's allow God to bring the victories in our life as he did in Gideon's life. But the enemy is silence. And he doesn't need the big numbers. He just needs a man or a woman that knows they're anointed. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. The spirit of the Lord is upon us, is within us. Let's make it personal, Lord. And my prayer is, Lord, that this word would not be robbed over a cup of tea and a biscuit. That it will go home with us and you'll keep on speaking. And that each one in this church tonight would come into a fuller understanding and revelation that God has anointed them, child of God, to be all they've called. All you've called them to do and to be. 
let's go on the offensive, Lord. Open mouths that are closed. Release the captives, people who are bound with fear, who won't testify, who won't speak, who won't sing that song. Bring your body into action, Lord. Release your church into all it's called to be. The fullest potential, Lord, that we might become that mighty army that will go forward and drive back the enemy. And see the name of Jesus Christ, honored and glorified in our life. I ask it in Jesus' name.